three, two, one. Welcome back to the Early Career Immunology Seminar Series. For those of you returning, thank you for your continued support. If this is your first time watching us live, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Tim O'Sullivan. I'm an assistant professor of immunology at UCLA. The purpose of this seminar series is to increase the exposure of early career faculty in a time in which we have not yet achieved equal representation at scientific conferences and seminars despite equally innovative discoveries. We're really excited to have Nick Joshi with us today. Nick received his PhD from Yale of working with Sue Keck. His graduate work focused on the mechanisms that control how effector T cells become memory T cells. And so Nick's work largely defined um, how short-lived effector T cells develop during acute infection and how the environmental factors drive effector T cells to become short-lived effectors. He then went on to postdoc with Tyler Jacks, where he described how Tregs present in uh, tumor-associated tertiary lymphoid structures inhibit anti-tumor uh, anti T cell responses. After all of these exciting discoveries, Nick returned to New Haven to establish his lab at Yale, where his group has created a number of immunogenic gem models to study how T cell function and differentiation in different cancer subtypes uh, and healthy tissues. Uh, if you have any questions during his talk, go ahead and type them into the chat box and I'll ask these questions at the end of the talk. Nick, thanks for being here today and it's all yours. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation and for, for setting this up. Uh, it's been really fun to watch these talks. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about some of the work that my lab has been doing, uh, focused largely on um, understanding the mechanisms, uh, some new mechanisms of how uh, immunologic tolerance and specifically uh, peripheral tolerance for T cells might be being mediated. I'll talk a little bit uh, about some of our cancer work as well, uh, but as I mentioned, most of the focus will be on tolerance. And so uh, I, I wanted to, since this is kind of a broad audience that could be watching this talk, I wanted to start off with kind of a, a maybe a, a more philosophical dis, di, discussion about what tolerance is. Uh, and so I, I, I like this quote, uh, just the definition of tolerance is the ability, the ability or willingness to tolerate something that one does not necessarily agree with. And this is definitely the problem that the immune system has to deal with and specific that, specifically that, that T cells have to deal with. They, you know, they have... Um, Re randomly rearranged re receptors on their surface that can recognize antigens from a variety of different sources. These could come from uh, many harmful things such as, this, such as bacteria, viruses, even tumors. Uh, and of course, we want to make a robust response against those, those types of things. But we also have a number of things in the body, uh, such as self antigens, we have commensal bacteria, we have even allergens that we, we don't want to make immune response to. We want, we want to have tolerance to these things. And so this is a very fine line that the immune system must, must walk to try and, uh, to try and make this, this happen. Uh, so we're very interested in how this balance is, is, is established. Of course, there's a lot known about this subject. Uh, nothing I'm going to start telling you is very new. Uh, it, it's been known for decades that, that in the thymus you have central tolerance where you remove autoreactive thymocytes against the majority of your self antigens. Uh, and that's done through the expression of, of, of antigens in the context of these uh, medullary thymic epithelial cells that then give off antigens or directly present antigens to autoreactive thymocytes. And you either get death of those cells or you might get the formation of Tregs for CD4s. Of course, this is imperfect. We know from work from Google work from Mark Davis and others that there are autoreactive CD8s and CD4 T cells even in healthy patients, uh, healthy people, and, and that these are, are present in the, in the circulation. So it's an imperfect process. So we, we have this secondary process we think of called uh, peripheral tolerance where T cells could get a number of signals that uh, help them to, no, to not make responses against self antigens. And specifically, uh, we think of T cells as requiring three antigens associated with becoming, three signals associated with activation. So canonically, we think about them getting uh, TCR signals through the T cell receptor, getting uh, co-stimulatory signals through CD28, uh, and then also getting cytokine signals. And if they don't get these signals, if they say just get signal one, uh, they may, might go into an energic state, which means that they never acquire a functional capacity. Uh, they don't become very proliferative. They, they, they can often die. We see, we see clonal deletion. And by contrast, if they get these three signals, now they can uh, have much more function. They become effector CD8 T cells. Those cells can produce lytic molecules. They can also produce cytokines. And those cytokines and lytic molecules can help them to uh, attack, the, say, the infection or, or the cancer and to mediate destruction of that. Uh, in the context of chronic challenges now, it's been very appreciated by work from many, many labs now 
uh, that is focused on how these responses are, are resolved and, and really how we sustain responses under chronic condition. Uh, and, and what we know is that CD8 T cells become, uh, become shut down, they become uh, terminally differentiated. We think of this, some people call this exhaustion. Uh, this is really a way by which T cells lose some of their functions. They're not completely non-functional, but they turn off a lot of their functions in order to preserve uh, homeostasis and not to cause immunopathology. Uh, we see that uh, through uh, their ability to secrete lytic molecules, their ability to produce cytokines, which is often diminished, the ability to proliferate, which is really, really often uh, very diminished, uh, and also uh, their expression of these inhibitory uh, receptors that provide inhibitory signals that counteract, say, the positive signals they would get from, from, uh, from T cell signaling. And many of these are famous now because uh, we know that in the clinic we can provide, uh, in the context of cancer patients, we can provide inhibitors to these, these molecules, we can block these interactions, and now we can get back some of these functions. And so this just shows one patient, an example of a patient who has metastatic melanoma, uh, and you can see this is a liver metastasis that's being tracked here, and when they get uh, CTLA-4 and then they get PD, anti-PD-1, so blockade of two of these molecules subsequ uh, sequentially, now they get a very robust response and they reject all of the tumors throughout their body and, and they, they become tumor-free. So it's a really remarkable uh, sort of therapy that can happen in, in patients. And so this has been a, an ongoing story for the past like 10 or 12 years. We're really starting to understand that these immune checkpoint receptors are having an important role in, in, in regulating the anti-tumor responses uh, by T cells that exist when people come into the clinic uh, but, are, but are inhibited uh, because of these, these receptors. And when we block these receptors with the antibodies, now we see these really great responses in a very small fraction of patients. Uh, and that tells us that these receptors have an active role in, in preventing the response uh, up until the point at which the antibody is given. However, uh, what has become very apparent uh, and, and will be really a large focus of the talk today uh, is this idea that uh, these, these uh, after the uh, treatment with these inhibitory receptors, especially in the combination therapies where you're getting blockade of PTLA-4 and PD-1, you get a lot of these localized autoimmune-like side effects. We call these immune-related adverse events or IREs, and these happen in, in the majority of patients who are treated with combination therapy. What these are, they're like, uh, they're like sort of uh, localized autoimmune reactions. Uh, they can be rashes, they can be colitis, uh, they can happen in a variety of different tissues, and often it seems like at random. Uh, and, and it's not really associated with whether the, the, there's a good anti-tumor response. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of questions about what's driving these things. We know that you can treat them often non-specifically with steroids or with some uh, more targeted agents like TNF blockers, uh, but we're not clear about how those treatments really uh, affect the anti-tumor response. And also, what's probably most problematic is that the threat of these, these, uh, these IRAEs is now one of the biggest uh, uh, barriers to giving combination therapy to a large fraction of patients who might benefit from it. So that's what's happening clinically. What's happening uh, sort of in, the, in the, uh, our, our understanding of the immune response has been that these, these adverse events have really taught us something that was a little bit unexpected, and that is the idea that these immune checkpoint receptors have a very important in, uh, role in, in terms of maintaining homeostasis in the body and in terms of potentially regulating self-reactive T cells because when we block them now, we're getting some amount of autoimmunity. In patients, and this is happening in 80% of patients, so it's not even people who are necessarily autoimmune prone who are getting this. So they're, they're, these seem to be important in, in normal, healthy people. Today, I'm gonna to tell you about two stories. Uh, one is published, so I'll go through it kind of quickly uh, and, and discuss some of our, our work on trying to understand in the context of developing tumors, kind of following up on that first role, how are T cell responses maintained over the course of tumor development? Uh, this is a, a seminar series, which I think is uh, one of the best parts about it is we highlight some of the people in the labs who are doing the work uh, in, in, and who are really taking a risk by coming into our labs. Uh, one of those is uh, Kelly Connolly, who's a very, very talented uh, postdoc who's in my lab who's, who spearheaded the first project, uh, and she's been working with uh, two very talented graduate students, Menik and uh, Arthi, who work in Smita Krishnaswamy's lab, who's a, just a phenomenal bioinformaticist who's here at Yale. Uh, we also, uh, I'm going to talk about in the second, the second part of the story, uh, the second part of the talk, uh, an unpublished story that's really uh, going into some of the mechanisms by which uh, we think IREs might be happening. And this has been, oh, I'm sorry, I, miss, I forgot to change the name here. This is actually Martina Damo, who's a, a postdoc in my lab. Uh, she's a, just phenomenally talented as well. Uh, she's done a tremendous amount of work to, uh, to, to help solve this. I apologize that her name is 
uh, incorrect there. Uh, and she's been assisted in this process by Noah Hornick, who's a, who's a dermatologist in the lab, and also by Sam Sui, who's, who's done some of the bioinformatics work. And then we've had some really good clinical collaborators, uh, John Leventhal and, and Bill Dansky, to do some of the human work. And so uh, what we were interested in, as I mentioned, is trying to understand this balance between uh, how T cells participate in anti-cancer responses and peripheral tolerance. And we, want, we kind of early on realized that we needed some animal models where we could study these two different processes in the context of, of normal healthy tissues or in the context of developing tumors. And so when I was a postdoc, I helped to start developing this mouse model we call Ninja. Uh, and the Ninja model uh, is really a very uh, useful tool for, for making inducible neoantigens in the setting where you have really good spatial and temporal control over when and where the antigen is expressed. Uh, and in addition, we've shown through uh, a lot of work that these, these antigens are not expressed at any, at even at a very low level uh, before we turn them on. And this helps us to avoid central tolerance in the, in the mouse. And so the way that we do this is that we, uh, we've created a, this allele that has two modules. It has a neoantigen module, which includes the, the inducible uh, neoantigen. Uh, and then it also has a regulatory module that includes the, a, a gene called FLIPO. FLIPO is the recombinase that's going to act on this inducible uh, neoantigen and then turn it on. And so the way this works is that we took an antigen substrate uh, that had uh, peptides for both CD8 and CD4 T cells. This is peptides from the lymphocytic choriomeningitis, which most people will recognize. Uh, GP33 and, and GP66. Uh, we, in the, in, we encoded these into DNA, and then in the DNA uh, that encodes the substrate, we added splice sites so that we create this central axon. And then we inverted this uh, in such a way that in the off state of this allele, you have the production of the, uh, sorry, the splicing skips this central axon. You have production of, of incomplete peptides, and so you don't actually make anything immunogenic. When you want to turn it on, you need to flip this axon around. And for that, we use these non-compatible FRIT sites, which respond to that recombinase I mentioned, FLIPO. FLIPO causes a permanent inversion in the, in the substrate, and now you get these splice sites that line up, and you get production of these antigens. And so we also wanted to make it so we could read out this neoantigen. And so the way that we did that was we embedded it within a GFP molecule that does something very useful, uh, where is it, in, in the off state, you get a non, non, um, uh, an early form of a, a stop codon uh, that truncates the protein, so you get half of the GFP, so it's non-fluorescent. Uh, when you now turn on the neoantigens, now you get the fully formed uh, GFP, and, and it encodes the antigen. So we can use the GFP as a metric for which cells are expressing the antigen and how much they're expressing it. Uh, we also have this regulatory module that uh, I mentioned, and this is what allows us to have that very good spatial and temporal control over uh, activation. So this includes the flip OER. Uh, flip OER in this case is broken in half and flipped around, very similar to what we did on the, on the neoantigen side. And the way this works is that we provide Cre recombinase. Cre is a, one of the first element. It's absolutely required to turn this thing on. That causes an inversion, a permanent inversion of the allele. It lines up the flip OER, and so now you can produce it. But it still requires doxycycline and tamoxifen to actually be turned on. So we can give this Cre, and then we can wait a little bit, and then we can give the toxicycline and tamoxifen. That allows us to actually initiate in engine expression based on when we give this doxycycline and tamoxifen, but to control where we express it based on the expression of where the Cre is. So in the context of our cancer models, we use these uh, genetically engineered mouse cancer models where we initiate a tumor by turning on an oncogene and removing a few, uh, the tumor suppressor of UFD3. So you can see here we use Cre to actually activate these by turning on uh, oncogenic KRAS and removing P53. Uh, and that also poisons these cells to now respond to, uh, to doxycycline tamoxifen and turn on antigen specifically within the developing tumor cell. That's how we study cancer. When we want to study tolerance, we actually use a different trick, which is that we use a, there are a number of different tissue-specific cre recombinase genes. Uh, we can cross our mouse to this, and then when we want to induce uh, test the, uh, the effect of the peripheral expression of those antigens, we now just provide the mice to cyclone tamoxifen and turn on the antigens. So the first story I'm going to tell you about is, is one, as I mentioned, that was recently published uh, that focuses on understanding how T cell responses are sustained in the context of a developing tumor. And so uh, I'll show you that we, we have some sort of idea about the cell types that will respond to immunotherapy uh, when, we, when we give immunotherapy, the specific subsets of CD8 T cells. But what we were particularly interested in is this idea that tumors develop over the course of months or years in the context of a, of a person. And we don't really have a good understanding of how these T cells that are, that are necessary to maintain the response or, or to, to elicit the therapeutic response 
We, we don't understand how those cells are, are maintained over the course of tumor development. How do they persist in the tumor microenvironment over many months or years? And so this is the, what's become kind of the paradigm for how T cells might function in the context of immune checkpoint therapy. And the idea that when T cells see exhaustion, or sorry, see chronic antigen, they become exhausted, they lose the function, as I mentioned earlier, and that this is really the majority of the cells that might be present in a tumor. However, there's also the presence of these stem-like T cells, and these are a less differentiated subset of T cells that express a marker TCF1 on their, uh, in, in their nucleus, it's a transcription factor. They also express low levels of PD-1, and, and they express often the, the uh, chemokine receptor CXCR5, and they express this uh, receptor called SLAMM6 that, that seems to be very important uh, for identifying these cells. So we think that chronic antigen is driving uh, these cells in a large part in the context of chronic infection and in, chron in, in tumors uh, towards this exhausted cell state. Uh, but if you give antibodies to, um, to, to PD-1, uh, often these cells are thought to now proliferate uh, and then give rise to these functional effector cells. Uh, and these are, these are cells that have granzyme, they make, effect, they make cytokines and can cause killing of tumors. So this is how we think that they're, they're actually uh, driving therapeutic responses by, by turning into these functional cells uh, that, that can be seen after checkpoint therapy. And so uh, work from just a number of really very great labs has shown uh, that uh, these cells are present in a lot, of, uh, a lot of human cancer types. I highlight this one from, uh, from a group in, in, uh, in Italy that, uh, that has really shown in human lung cancers, which is the cancer that we focus on. Uh, several years ago, they showed very nicely that these cells are present within the lung tumors. Uh, so they're, they're present. Uh, work from Nick Haining and others has highlighted the idea that these the presence of these cells in, in uh, human tumors correlates with better responses, and also this really fantastic uh, paper from Warner Health uh, where they, they actually showed in animal models that the presence of these cells was necessary inside of tumors uh, to actually get therapeutic responses. So we know these cells must be in the tumor to give out the therapeutic response, at least that's, that's what we think. So we want to understand how these cells are persisting in the context of our tumor models. Uh, and so we, we uh, initiate tumors and we call the KP ninja mouse, which has that ninja allele to elicit uh, the T cell response against, and then it develops tumors slowly over the course of several months. And then we're going to look at those tumors at what we call an early time point, which is about eight to 10 weeks, uh, and then a late time point when the tumors have matured into something that's uh, considerably larger and more, and more, uh, more advanced, and that's uh, around, 18 to, around 16 to 20 weeks. Uh, we use an intravascular labeling technique that many people use uh, where we inject antibodies. And, and because the lung is so highly vascularized, what this does is it allows us to determine which cells are in the lung because they show up as, as uh, antibody negative. Uh, you can see that in a, in a naive mouse, a B6 mouse, or in a, in a mouse that doesn't have KRAS, we've, we've given it all the same, uh, same uh, inducers, but it doesn't form a tumor. You can see that these cells are largely absent. Uh, and that allows us to at least feel confident that these cells that are present within the lung are there because of the tumor, because they're really only there when there's a tumor. We can gate on those cells uh, based on MHC class 1 tetramers, and we study the endogenous T cell response against these. And what we saw was that using the marker TCF1, uh, we were able to see that both at early time points and at late time points, there was a population of cells that is gated on these, they're antigen specific, everything I'll show you is antigen specific. Uh, they, they are in the lung tumors, uh, and that they, they express TCF1, a, a small fraction of them do. And, then, and all the cells in the tumor are expressing a, a moderate or to high amount of PD-1. If we waited for later time points, we saw that these cells were still there, so they're not going away. Uh, but what was really striking to us was the fact that there was a large number of these cells in the tumor-draining lymph node that were tumor-specific, that expressed high levels of TCF1, and that were expressing PD-1. So we knew that they were activated there. there. And what was really also very surprising to us was that these cells were present uh, kind of at early time points, but also they were maintained at late time points. And we had kind of predicted that over time we would, we would lose these cells, so we were very surprised that they would be still there in, in the late tumors, in the lymph nodes associated with late tumors. Just in terms of phenotyping, we did a little bit of phenotyping by fax. Uh, to show that these cells that are PD-1 uh, high, TCF1 high in the tumor, not a lot of them express this marker uh, SLAMF6, uh, 
Uh, but a large fraction of the cells that are in the draining lymph node are SLAMF6 positive. So uh, just in terms of the markers that they express, they're SLAMF6 positive. We think a fraction of them express CXCR5. Uh, they express other hallmark uh, genes that would be associated with, uh, with the stem-like cells. So it looks like these are the, the, the true stem-like cells that are present in, in the lymph nodes. We also looked at their ability to function by giving them peptide in vitro, uh, and what we saw was that so only the cells in the, in the draining lymph node are the ones that produce interferon gamma after, after stim. So they seem more functional as well. Now, we weren't the only people who were starting to think about what these cells are doing, and there's been a real flood of papers in the human space uh, focused around what is uh, this was thought to be maybe a more global response to immunotherapy, and this concept that when you give immunotherapy in, in patients now, you start to see the, the introduction of T cells into the tumor microenvironment that weren't there before. So if you look early and late, or if you have a if you look for clones that are that are shared with the blood, you start to see that there's an increase in these cells that you wouldn't have normally seen before. So this is suggesting that maybe some of the therapeutic response is coming from outside of the tumor. So also there's really great papers that came out uh, uh, late last year that focus on this concept that maybe you can elicit T cell responses uh, with immunotherapy by, by targeting the, the tumor draining lymph node. Uh, and so this, this, uh, they use very, very clever techniques to actually deliver uh, the antibody specifically to the draining lymph nodes and, and, and focus on this idea. So it really seems to be a, a hypothesis that maybe you could stimulate T cells before they leave the lymph node uh, by, by targeting them. We wanted to understand more about the biology of these cells, so uh, we performed single-cell RNA-seq. We took the, the draining lymph node and the tumors uh, from the early and the late mice. We sorted out the antigen-specific CD8 T cells using MHC with class 1 tetramers, and then we did uh, single-cell RNA-seq and paired TCR-seq on them. And I'm just going to show you the highlights of that data, uh, and namely that when we compare with this, this, this pro approach really allowed us to do uh, a number of different types of comparisons. If you want to look into more detail, it's in the paper. Uh, but what I was most interested in was this idea that we could compare both spatially and temporally uh, what were the, the, the tumor-specific T cells, uh, what, what were the phenotypes in kind of high-dimensional space. And so what we were able to do was, was to compare here, uh, looking at the, the T cells that are in the early tumors and in the late tumors, uh, we can see whether or not they, they have uh, overlapping gene expression. And we're using this technique called FATE that Smita's lab has developed. Uh, this is kind of like a UMAP, only uh, it, it allows a little bit better uh, visualization of the data. And uh, what you can see here is we have these light blue cells and dark blue cells. The light blue cells are from the early tumors and the dark blue cells are from the late tumors. And you can see that uh, I, I, what we've done, instead of giving gates, we've actually just marked where the prototypical stem-like cell would be and where the prototypical um, uh, exhausted cell would be, and what you can see is that the majority of the cells that are in that uh, near where the prototypical stem-like cell are, those cells are coming from the early tumors, and then when you look for the, the exhausted cells, a lot of those are coming from the late tumors. We also did unbiased pseudotime analysis uh, to show that uh, kind of the same thing, that in, in, in pseudotime, the early cells from the, the tumor were uh, earlier developmentally than the ones that come from the later tumor. So that was the tumor. We also looked at the draining lymph node in the same way. And what we were really surprised to see was that the majority of the cells uh, that were present in the, in the lymph node uh, really had fairly overlapping gene expression at, at between the early and the late and the late uh, uh, tumor, uh, tumor time points. Uh, and this is shown both by the fact that a large fraction of them are near this, uh, this lamppost uh, that, that uh, marks where the stem-like cells are, but also between the fact that when we look at pseudotime, the majority of the cells that are in the lymph node and in the, at the early and the late time points are overlapping in pseudotime. And then, what this, so this was a, a, a temporal comparison. Now we were able to do also a, a spatial comparison between the lymph node and the lungs. Uh, and when we did that, what we saw was that the cells that were present in the lungs, um, <coughs> excuse me, in the lymph nodes at early time points and at late time points uh, were, were largely falling into this uh, category of stem-like cells. And again, the ones that are in the tumors are falling into this category that's more differentiated. And we could really see this nice transition as cells would move from the lymph node, they would differentiate in the middle here uh, as they were entering the tumor and then become these more exhausted cells. And you can see that also in the pseudotime analysis. And so one question you might have is, well, how do I know these are the same cells? And, and for this, we were able to utilize the fact that we had done 
uh, TCR sequencing, and we could look at the same TCL, t same T cell clones, but because they have the same alpha and beta pairs uh, in the in the mouse. And, and so when we do that, what we can see is that this is just showing the top clones. Uh, you can see that they are actually shared between uh, with the cells that are in the in this uh, stem-like state, and then also in the exhausted state. And we did a number of other uh, types of comparisons in, in the paper uh, that that will, will, would support this concept. So what we were then interested in was this, this basic question of, of how is this whole system set up. What we thought was maybe that the, the, the lymph node was acting kind of like a reservoir of these cells uh, and that the, the tumors themselves were driving the terminal differentiation of these cells. So maybe in order to maintain the, the, the few stem-like cells that were present in the tumor, it was necessary for a fraction of these cells to migrate from the, from the lymph node to the, to the tumor. So this was an easy thing for us to test. We just provided these mice with FTY720 to block uh, migration and trap the cells in the lymph node. And when we did that, we did this over a period of, of three weeks uh, before the early time point. When we did this in the lymph node, what we saw was that, uh, sorry, when we did this in the mouse, what we saw was that on the right here with the FTY720, if you look at total number of T cells in the lymph node or the tumor, uh, you don't really see much of a difference. When you look specifically at the TCF1 high cells, the cells that we think are the, the cells that would be uh, most recently migrated, uh, now you see a pretty big drop off in those in those cells, uh, specifically within the FTY720 tumor to the uh, tumors. And when you look at the cells in the lymph node, there isn't any change, so that suggests that these cells really are just getting trapped in the lymph node, and that we aren't they aren't able to migrate into the tumor, uh, and therefore that's why we're seeing this drop off. So uh, the, the concept that we came up with was this idea that the tumor draining lymph node is, is really the site where these, these stem-like cells are, are maintained uh, within the context of a, of a developing cancer, uh, and that this site may be, may be a good site for, for maintaining them because uh, th we think that this is a site where there's not a lot of TCR signals. We don't think that there's a lot of, uh, of dendritic cells that, that, are, that are potentially presenting antigen to these to these, uh, these T cells, and so therefore, when we look at things like TCR signaling, they seem to be very low for TCR signaling in the tumor, in the, in the draining lymph nodes. By contrast, in the tumors, almost all the cells are seeing TCR signals at any given moment when we looked at them. Uh, we also see that they're, they, they seem to be differentiating, probably as a result of seeing that chronic antigen. So we think that just having these cells off-site may be, may be very important uh, for actually protecting them and, and for maintaining the response over long periods of time. Uh, there's been a number of studies. We had a tiny bit of data on this in our paper, but really some way better studies are coming out now uh, looking at this same phenomenon now, taking human tumors uh, and, and paired lymph nodes and actually looking for these. I really want to highlight this, this fantastic study that came out in our archives a couple weeks ago uh, by, by a group in, in, uh, in at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, Matt Hellman's group, where they, they really have looked at uh, comparing the, the T cells at both, in both the lymph node and the tumor using TCRC, kind of the equivalent of what we did in the mouse, and showing that, that, that there really is good overlap there uh, between the cell subsets. So it really supports this idea that the tumor draining lymph node contains these cells, and that may be useful. And so one of the big questions that we have, and I think a lot of people have in this field now, is that these cells aren't just in the tumor, but they're in the lymph node. Is this a therapeutic opportunity? Should we be designing drugs that actually target these stem-like cells uh, within the draining lymph node and try and either do a couple of things. One would be to actually stimulate them to see if you can drive them into the tumor. The other which would be to try and prevent them once they get into the tumor from, from undergoing uh, exhaustive processes. So I think these are kind of a, a combination of two different things that, that have been thought about for a while, but now this kind of provides a new, a new angle on how it might be done. Okay. So uh, now I'm going to switch uh, gears and talk a little bit more about the, the other topic that I wanted to cover today, and that's trying to understand the, the mechanisms uh, by which PD-1 and, and the PD-1 receptor is involved in, in maintaining peripheral tolerance. And as I mentioned, and I, I really do apologize because I copied this uh, very quickly last night, uh, this is Martina Damo. Let's uh, make that very clear. Martina is, is the uh, postdoc who's led all this work. She's actually going on the job market, which is one of the, one of the reasons I'm uh, specifically want to highlight her. She's a fantastic postdoc and going to make a very good uh, PI uh, going forward. So she, she, Martina came to my lab and she was very interested in, in tolerance. She had actually worked on tolerance, so she really brought this, this approach of trying to ask what, what are these, uh, what, what's going on in our models using, using the models to study peripheral tolerance. And what I wanted to highlight was this idea that we've known for a long time that PD-1 seems to be involved in maintaining T-cell homeostasis. 
Uh, but it's never really been quite clear what the role of PD-1 is in, in, in peripheral tolerance. And, I, and I'll go, ahead, go through some of that data to highlight where we think that the hole actually is. So PD-1 provides an inhibitory signal uh, that counteracts the signals that are coming from the TCR and uh, from COSIN. So not surprisingly, PD-1 uh, knockouts and, and, and the functions of PD-1 seem to have a lot, a lot of different roles. So there was uh, very nice work early on from Arlen Sharp and others highlighting the role of PD-1 potentially in, in, in thymic selection, um, specifically in, in positive selection. Some, some nice work focused on uh, the role that PD-1 might play in, in the, the tolerance of, of recent thymic immigrants when they leave the thymus uh, through nonspecific processes of activation, i.e. seeing TCR uh, without necessarily looking at the peptide that they're seeing. Uh, also, the role that PD-L1 might play in terms of uh, suppressing cells uh, as they go through the endothelium. So another sort of non-specific process by which it could, it could be involved. And then finally, this idea that it's, it's involved in, in, in helping Tregs to have their function. So these are uh, a number of different mechanisms that were described uh, to, to explain how uh, P1 might be involved in, in homeostasis. And this explains uh, maybe some of the findings that were coming out of the mouse model when you looked at the PD-1 knockout mouse. And the PD-1 knockout mouse uh, had a, a, an autoimmune phenotype. It was, it was fairly subtle. They would, at, at some low rate, get uh, lupus uh, or they would get cardiomyopathy, depending on the type of, of, of genetic background that they were on. Uh, and so this has been known. You can see this, this is from 1999. So this has been known for a long time that this could be involved in, in, in receptor, or sorry, in um, uh, in, in homeostasis, but the function of it has never really been that clear. And most of the studies that were done on the role of PD-1 in, in, in tolerance has really focused on this idea that if we get rid of it in autoimmune prone settings, we, we predispose these mice to getting a uh, really rapid onset to, uh, autoimmune disease. So it seems to be important in restraining autoimmune disease, uh, potentially after the point when you've initiated it. Uh, and I'll come back to that point in a second. However, this was a little bit different than what we're seeing in patients who are relatively normal up until the time that they're treated with these checkpoint receptors. So this is showing you data from a cell paper that came out recently uh, that focused on this, uh, the, 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 the cells that are, are observed after dual checkpoint therapy in the context of colitis. Uh, and what you can see is that these, these cells, which are tissue resonant memory cells, uh, those cells uh, they showed were clonally related to the, the, cell, the cytotoxic lymphocytes that came out and seemed to be mediating the disease, suggesting that the cells that were giving rise to the disease were actually present before, uh, before the treatment and they were in the tissue. Uh, the other thing is that they, they, uh, there were some studies in, in cutaneous dermatitis, uh, which, is, which is what I'm going to focus a little bit on, uh, showing that you could get CD8 and CD4 T cells into the tissue. You would get these uh, really strong uh, anti-skin responses, uh, and that in some cases these would have monoclonal peaks of of, of these of, of CD8 T cells, I'm sorry, of, of T cells, alpha beta T cells, suggesting that there was a very specific antigen these these uh, T cells were responding to. Uh, and then this this dovetails with another series of, of of studies that have been done on the role of PD1 in terms of its role in, in peripheral tolerance, and this is what most people may be more familiar with, with which is how is PD-1 involved in maybe the induction of T-cell energy? And so going back, uh, you know, many decades now, uh, this is a, a fairly well-known study where uh, Linda Sherman's group took, uh, took a mouse where it expresses antigen in the, in the uh, pancreas. They transferred in antigen-specific T-cells into that mouse, and they showed you get this really nice uh, energy that's, that's elicited that, that way, and that you could break that energy if you gave the mouse a, a nonspecific uh, TLR signal, they gave uh, TLR ligands, or if you just give influenza, you could now break the, the energy and now you would get T cells that make interferon gamma, uh, whereas in the context of no, no, no TLR signal, now you don't get that. Our Arlene Sharp's lab used this very similar model where the T cells were getting energy and showed that if you uh, get rid of PD-1 on these cells, now you'll get uh, T cells that proliferate more, they have more function, and you'll also get, uh, you'll also get disease in this model. So that suggested that PD-1 was very important in blocking the process of energy. Uh, but Vibro Desdes and, and Brian Fife had this uh, really great paper uh, looking at uh, T cell responses in the small intestine, and they showed that while you, this was true very early on, if you give a blocking antibody to T cells transferred into this mouse, so this is a mouse which expresses antigen within the small intestine, if you give T cells uh, to that mouse and you give blocking antibody right away, 
those T cells become activated uh, and, and, and will have effector function. They make gamma, they make TNF, uh, they make uh, granzyme. But if you wait a little bit and they get tolerized, now those T cells no longer have this ability to respond to PD-1. So this was an irreversible energy. And this fit with kind of our, our, our previous notions of how uh, T cell tolerance works in, in that uh, once you've established T cell energy, now you can't break it uh, associated with, with therapy. So we wanted to study whether this was true uh, using the NINJA model. And specifically, uh, we were able to, to now do something that was a little different from what had been previously done in, in that we could turn on antigens peripherally and then study endogenous T cell responses against those antigens just using MHC class one tetramers. So this is showing you uh, turning on antigens in a variety of tissues. Uh, and I'm gonna focus on the skin here, but we've done this in the pancreas, we've done this in the colon, we've done this in the skin, and we've done this actually in the liver. Uh, I won't talk about the liver, but this is really the outlier where we don't see T cell responses. But in both the pancreas and the gut, we see pretty robust antigen specific T cells uh, by, the, by the T cells that are, that, are, that are specific for the antigens once we turn them on. When we look in the, in the skin now, this is using a Rosa 26 Cre, where we're painting on tamoxifen. Uh, we get a fairly robust T cell response, and that'll be the focus of what uh, I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so we, we set this up so we could paint tamoxifen on the skin of the mouse, uh, and then we would, we would study what happened to the T cells either if we did or didn't give checkpoint therapy. And what was really very uh, gratifying to see is if we just turn on antigen uh, and we look at see what happens, there really wasn't much of an effect. We just give checkpoint therapy without turning on antigens now, we don't see much of an effect. And when we give the combined therapy, we're give, turning on antigen in the skin in this, in this little square, uh, we're also giving checkpoint therapy. Now we get uh, a, a skin disease that looks a lot like what we're going to call a, a, um, a lichenoid dermatitis that, that forms in the context of patients. And this is just quantification, and, and this was done, uh, we have a, a dermatologist, who, uh, a practicing dermatologist who's in the lab who did all our quantifications for it. And uh, he and uh, some of the other dermatologists we have, we see patients with, with lichenoid uh, dermatitis associated with IRAs. Uh, they, they were very nicely willing to help us to, to actually compare these uh, directly. So this is just quantification using a pathological score that he, that he created based on the disease features that he would see in the patients. Uh, this is showing a, this is a nice comparison showing some of the features that may be relevant uh, in these diseases. I won't go into this, but because it's recorded, if people are interested, they can go back and look at this. Uh, but we did see a number of features that, that you would expect to see in the human disease uh, that are present within the mouse. We also looked at the, the histology at the, the, the level of the, the tissue, uh, and what we saw was that in contrast to the controls where we either didn't turn on antigen, we just gave a uh, checkpoint receptor blockade, or we just turned on antigen. We didn't really see much of an effect in thickening of the epidermis, but when we turn on antigen and, and give uh, a checkpoint blockade, now we get uh, a very marked thickening of the, of, the, of the epithelium. You can't see it here, but there's a lot of uh, lymphocytes that are lined up kind of at this interface. Uh, and, and the thicken and those those end up being uh, T cells. Uh, we've quantified it here a little bit to show that there are these features that are associated with lichenoid dermatitis. Again, I'm not a dermatologist, but this was this was made by dermatologists, including keratinocytes that are that are. Um, uh, and this is the human on the on the right and the mouse on the left. You can see these uh, necrotic keratinocytes, which are very prominent in the, in the epidermis. There's also spongiosis, uh, which you can see as these these kind of gaps. Uh, in between, in between the, uh, the the keratinocytes themselves, so we see both of these features that are that are thought to be uh, conditions that that arise in this in this very specific uh, IRE after therapy. So we were pretty excited to be able to see those. We also showed another feature that's been uh, associated with the human disease, uh, and that is this idea that the disease is really induced by PD-1 or by checkpoint disease, but checkpoint, uh, dual checkpoint therapy with with PD-1 and CTLA-4, uh, but not really with CTLA-4 on its own. So that seemed to fit nicely with what people had planned. Uh, the next thing we wanted to do was to ask, you know, we've never had a model of IRAEs like this where you don't get disease or you do get disease when you give checkpoint therapy. So we wanted to understand some of the mechanisms behind it. Uh, the first thing we did was just base, look basically at what was going on uh, with, the, with the T cells that were infiltrating the, 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 the tissue. Uh, previously, it's been shown that both CD8 and CD4s infiltrate the tissue. We saw that our, our infiltrate was predominantly cd 8 uh, you can see here there are some CD4s, but not, not a large fraction, uh, and that the CD8s uh, were present in the skin whether we gave checkpoint or whether we didn't, but there was a market expansion of those cells, about a tenfold expansion of those cells when we, when we gave the checkpoint therapy. 
we showed that if you deplete the CD8, so not the CD4s, that you could get rid of the disease, which fits with the idea that in at least CD8s are sufficient to cause that. It doesn't say that in humans that CD4s don't have a role. They just don't seem to be playing a major role in this particular model. Uh, and we also used the transfer of, of antigen-specific T cells. So everything I've shown you before was endogenous cells. We used this transfer of antigen-specific cells to allow us to track things like the clonality of the cells, or sorry, the kinetics of the cells, and also to track uh, the, the, the location within the skin of the antigen-specific cells. And so we have these uh, really nice uh, luciferase-expressing uh, cells. Uh, these are P14 cells that are specific for those antigens. We also have DS red cells. We transfer them in, and, and then we, we do the same thing. This, this changes uh, very little about the, the, the model in terms of the outcomes. The disease is a little bit more severe when you have these cells, but overall, it's not like uh, it changes the disease that much. Uh, what's critical is that this allowed us to track what happens to the antigen-specific cells, both in the presence or in the absence of, of, of therapy, where you can see kind of early on they're, they're located in the lymph nodes and maybe the spleen. Later on, now you're getting uh, the, the, the localization of cells, even in the absence of checkpoint therapy in the, in the skin, uh, but it's much more pronounced when you have checkpoint therapy. Additionally, now we could see where in the skin these cells were getting, and what's, what's uh, probably uh, harder to see uh, on this slide, but maybe hopefully you can see, that there's a lot of cells in the, epi in the dermis here of these red cells. These are all the antigen-specific cells. There's a lot of them uh, in the dermis if we, if we don't give checkpoints. Now when we give checkpoints, now these cells are really highly invasive of the, of the, of the epidermis, uh, and that seems to be uh, associated with, with where, the, where the disease is actually occurring. Uh, because we have put antigens into the system that, that are fluorescent, we can see which, which cells uh, are expressing the antigens. And what you can see is that in the absence of checkpoint receptors uh, blockade, uh, you can see that we're inducing uh, GFP-positive cells. And I'll show you in a second. These are mostly uh, epithelial cells. Uh, but when we give the combination therapy, now these cells are being uh, ablated. Uh, and we know this is done by CD8 T cells because if we give anti-CD8 beforehand, we can block this destruction. And as I remember, mentioned, uh, the majority of these cells that seem to be turning positive are, are, are epithelial cells in the skin. Uh, we think these are keratinocytes uh, for, the, for the most part, and that those are, those are the cells that are then being destroyed uh, after we give checkpoint therapy. Okay, so we wanted to understand, again, more about the biology of what's going on here and, and really try and understand what's changing about the CD8 T cells. After we, after we give these therapies. And so what we did was we, we treated these mice, uh, the mice that have this DS red T cells in them uh, with either, uh, with, with either the, the, the tamoxifen and doxycycline to turn on the antigen, or we're gonna give um, a checkpoint therapy on top of that. And just, uh, just so that everybody knows, we also gave doxycycline and tamoxifen to our ninja mice. So they're getting the same treatment, they just don't have the recombination, or uh, the, uh, the recombinase that's necessary to turn on the antigen. Uh, within the tissue. So that we felt like was the best control. We did, uh, we did, we digested these and then we performed whole tissue uh, uh, single cell RNA-seq and TCR-seq to try and understand what was, what was different between the groups. And so this is just showing you kind of the, what I call like the, 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 the Godzilla plot because this kind of looks like uh, the, the, uh, the, the monkey, the, the, uh, this is King Kong and this is Godzilla. People can disagree with, me, disagree with me if they want. Uh, but uh, so over here in King Kong, we have epithelial cells uh, that are very, very prominent uh, when we have uh, not turned on antigen. And when you, when you give the checkpoint therapy, you can see that a lot of the epithelial cells are, are disappearing. Uh, we also see changes in the T cell compartment and the myeloid compartment uh, that I'll talk about in some detail. So just focusing on the myeloid cells and the changes that we saw in the myeloid cells, uh, what we had, what had previously been noted by uh, investigators looking at the disease that comes out is that there were a lot of these CD14 positive, CD16 positive, maybe some sort of macrophage. I'm going to try and be careful about what I call them because I don't really know a lot about which myeloid cells are which, uh, and I know that there's a lot of thoughts about this. So, so I just, I, if I call them the wrong thing, I apologize. Uh, but we were very interested in the fact that we were seeing pretty profound changes in the, in the myeloid compartment when we just turned on antigen. And again, these mice are treated the same way. They have the same, they're both treated with doxin tamoxifen. They both, uh, you know, we're taking the tissue out the same way at the same time, uh, but only in the case where we don't have the, the, the recombinase, we're seeing that Langerhan cells are really predominant uh, in, in those no antigen mice. But when we turn on antigen, now we see this influx of, or, or this change in the population so now we get a lot of these uh, cells that we think maybe are some sort of dermal uh, macrophage, uh, 
Uh, we also see that um, there's this uh, increase in CD8 positive DCs, and this seems to be re uh, retained when we give uh, antigen and checkpoint therapy. So it seems to be something that's happening largely when we just give the antigen. So what's driving this? Uh, well, what we looked at was first we looked at whether or not uh, these cells were, were consistent with these uh, cells that have been described before, and they, the cells up at the top here, these uh, these group zero, group uh, two cells, they, they express lots of uh, CD14 and CD16. They also express PDL1, so we thought maybe these cells could be important uh, in, in, in delivering the PD1 signal to the, to the T cells. Uh, that's some work that's ongoing right now. Uh, but what was really striking to us was that when we looked at PDL1 globally, these were the only cells that were consistently expressing it uh, in the mice without checkpoint therapy and with checkpoint therapy. So we looked by facts and we saw the same thing, that this was a C11B positive, C11C positive population that was increased uh, after we gave uh, antigen. Uh, and, then, and then those cells were the ones that were largely upregulating PDL1 on their surface. Uh, we also showed that if we got rid of interferon gamma or if we got rid of CD8 T cells, that these processes didn't really occur. We mostly focused on the upregulation of PDL1 on these cells, and that was a gamma-dependent process and also a CD8 T cell-dependent process. So that suggests that uh, something surprising to us is, is that when we're turning on antigens and we're getting the influx of, of CD8 T cells, that's causing a little bit of a change in the myeloid compartment, uh, but that doesn't seem to be associated with the disease. So the next thing we asked is what, what's happening to the T cells that are actually present in the disease uh, setting. So uh, this is just showing you all of the T cells, uh, and what you can see is you can see a decrease in gamma delta T cells uh, whether, when we turn on antigen, and that's further uh, seen when we give antigen plus checkpoint. Uh, there are some increases in T rags, but the really predominant change is this increase uh, in CD8 T cells, which is expected. Of course, because these mice had these uh, DS red positive P14 cells, we could gate on the, the antigen specific cells and try and understand more about the biology of these cells and how it had changed in the context of just either giving antigen or antigen plus checkpoint receptor. And so uh, this is so I just wanted to remind you of the difference in pathology that we saw uh, between these cells. This is uh, the checkpoint therapy treated mice. Uh, and the mice that get uh, just, just the antigen alone, in both cases, we're seeing these CD8 T cells that are present within the, in the setting. Uh, but the well, first thing we did was we just lined up all the genes that these cells expressed, and we asked, what are the differentially expressed genes? And it was really shocking to us that there were very few differentially expressed genes between these two settings. So uh, this is just a, a, a correlation plot where you can see all of the genes that they express. And on the, on the y-axis, you can see the cells that are, the genes that are higher in the cells that are, that are given, checkpoint plus combo. Uh, and uh, on the bottom, you can see the, the genes that are higher in the cells that get just checkpoint. What you can see is there's a handful of genes that are differentially expressed, but for the most part, the genes are, are fairly similar in terms of their, their transcriptional levels. And in order to try and convince ourselves that this is true, we looked at heat maps of these genes, and it just focused on this, this panel here. You can see that for the majority of, the, of these effector genes here, granzyme B, fast ligand, perforin, uh, other, other molecules, for the majority of them, uh, the, the cells that just got antigen alone are actually as high or higher than in terms of their gene expression level of, of these genes. Only granzyme A seemed to be increasing. We created something called an effector score and, and showed that these uh, these genes are really not very changed, uh, you know, between antigen alone and, and checkpoint uh, plus antigen. Uh, we also showed that if you just remove granzyme A, this one was slightly higher, but that granzyme A seems to be the main difference in that. So this was really confusing to us because we were expecting to see a lot of differences in genes. Uh, we, we, we really spent a lot of time trying to focus on this and trying to understand what was different. Uh, but ultimately, we were also in parallel looking at, at these T cells using antigen stems and, and, and out of ex vivo stems, looking at protein level expression between uh, the, the, the checkpoint therapy treated mice and the, and, the, and the controls. And what we saw there was quite a difference in terms of the expression of the production of proteins associated with these, uh, these conditions. So when we just turned on antigen, we saw that the majority of the cells that we were getting out didn't produce uh, interferon gamma, and there was a small fraction that did produce interferon gamma, but this was much lower than what we were seeing when we looked at mice that got gamma, or, sorry, antigen and checkpoint therapy in the skin. We also saw this increase in granzyme A, but if we looked at granzyme B, another classic marker of T cell function, uh, we saw that these, these, uh, the cells 
uh, were, were, were expressing high levels of that in both cases. So there really did seem to be a few genes that were changing, uh, especially these, these cytokines, uh, but we really, uh, at the transcriptional level, there wasn't much of a difference. So we want to understand, you know, maybe we thought that, the, that it's probably these, these changes at the protein level that seem to be maybe driving the disease, and we want to understand whether this was something that was acquired because we gave checkpoint therapy, i.e., we had activated cells in the, in the lymph node, and now when we gave the checkpoint therapy, we were doing something different. We were gaining a property. Or whether, conversely, these cells were functional before they entered the tissue and they were losing function as a consequence of going into the tissue, and maybe that checkpoint therapy would block this loss of function, and that would be how we got the pathology. In line with this, uh, with, with, with this we looked at where PD-1 was expressed on the cells, and, and what we saw was that uh, the majority of the cells in the tissue were expressing PD-1, uh, whereas in the lymph node it was considerably lower, about three to four-fold lower in the, in the lymph node, and that when we gave the antibody, we could see that the antibody was binding because it would block. Uh, you can see this shifts down. Uh, you can see in vivo this is blocking antibody. Uh, the effect is, is that it's actually decreasing the amount of, of, of surface expression of PD-L1 or PD-1. So we think that the antibody can, can bind to the, to the receptor in the tissue. We also looked at, at the function of the cells when we looked at the lymph node versus the skin. And what we saw was that in contrast to the mice when you give antigen plus, plus checkpoint where there's not really much of a difference between uh, the lymph node and, and the tissue, when you look at the antigen alone mice, you see that the T cells in the lymph node tend to be more functional than the ones that are found in the, in the tissue uh, after, after, uh, in the absence of checkpoint therapy. So there really does seem to be both for the change in, in gamma, also in TNF, uh, when they enter the tissue, they seem to be losing their, their effector function, uh, at least at the protein level. We also showed that, uh, you know, for the, for the cytolytic proteins that I showed you earlier, they were expressing these proteins, but in order for them to express them and actually function, they have to be able to externalize them. They have to be able to secrete them as lytic granules. Uh, and when we look at their ability to do degranulation, we see that in the lymph node, they, they can degranulate very well. But when we look in the skin, most of the cells that are present there really can't uh, degranulate, and that's why they can't upregulate CD107A. So even though they're making these cytolytic proteins, we don't think that they're actually able to, to do killing, and that's something we're actively trying to show right now uh, through an ex vivo uh, killing assay. <laughs> this, this, was, this phenomenon was not as strong uh, in the context of the mice that get antigen plus combination therapy, which suggests that, um, that, this, this, uh, that these cells maybe at the post-transcription level can't kill because they can't degranulate, they can't produce cytokines at the same level. So they really are tolerized, but they're tolerized uh, largely at what we think is the post-transcriptional level. So that takes you to the model uh, of how we think this works, and this is uh, one of my final slides. Uh, we think that uh, in the context of at least the skin, that when we turn on antigens and, and that this may be part of the natural regulation of the skin, uh, that there are some activation of, of, of T cells uh, within the lymph nodes and that these T cells do have a factor function. So this is not like classic tolerance where the T cells are not functional and, and therefore they never acquire it. These T cells seem to be largely functional. When they go into the tissue now, we think that they're uh, secreting maybe a little bit of interferon gamma, and this is important for altering the dermal myeloid cell subsets in the, in, the, in the tissue, and this is something we're fairly actively working on. We think that this is resulting in PDL1 upregulation, and this feedback loop is what's keeping these cells from, from causing disease. Uh, but when we give checkpoint therapy, now we, we block this interaction, and that now we get these T cells that get up into the epidermis secrete cytokines and, 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 and cytolytic molecules and cause a lot of pathology. So just in summary, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, as, as, uh, um, as Tim mentioned earlier that I, that I used to work on acute infection, uh, this is sort of what, how we thought that this process worked in acute infection where, where T cells had function kind of both as memory precursor effector cells and as short-lived effector cells that the, the functional capacity was, was there uh, and that cells could make cytotoxic and, and cyto, uh, cytokine genes uh, in acute infection. That's kind of all the cells could do this. In the context of chronic infection, we think that there's a stem-like cell that really doesn't have all these functional qualities that reside in the, in the lymph node and that when it goes into the tumor, it can either acquire these, especially in the context of PD-1 blockade, uh, and cause destruction. What I'm describing in, in, the, in the tolerance setting, we think is something a little bit different. Uh, classically, we think about that as being T cell energy, and, and I didn't have time to tell you this, but we see this in the, in the um, 
in the liver model that when you look at the liver model, you get a lot more of this energic T cell phenotype. So it's not like that doesn't happen. But in the skin, we seem to think that there's a different pathway whereby now you're getting these non-pathologic effector cells that when they migrate into the tissue, they really become tolerized uh, at the post-transcriptional level, and therefore they're unable to mediate effector function and not cause pathology. Uh, when we give uh, PD-1 blockade in this case, we think that now we can unleash these cells uh, and they'll cause disease, and that's ultimately why uh, now we're seeing uh, the disease that, that comes out. And that, that we think, uh, I think most importantly, we think that's the, the mechanism for, for how patients are getting IREs, that they have uh, T cells in their, in their skin and, and maybe other tissues that are being completely held in check by, uh, by, by the, the checkpoint receptors, but those are functional effector T cells so that when they give blockade, now those T cells will attack the skin. So this is the most important slide. I mentioned some of the people along the way. I really want to highlight Martina since her other uh, um, slides didn't actually say the correct name. Uh, Noah, who's a, a dermatologist who's been working in the lab, uh, and then uh, Kelly uh, Connolly, who's, who's been very important in the, in the first story, and the, the, uh, the funding sources that we have. And with that,